Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us. Um, it is really good uh, response in LinkedIn, and I appreciate from whichever part of your of the world you're coming from. Uh, I hope you had a safe and uh, a pleasant winter break, and you're back to 2021. And I wish a successful 2021 to all of you. Uh, today we have uh, Ms. Rachel Jensen, and thanks a lot for joining us, Rachel. Uh, she's uh, she has a master's in master of philosophy in metallurgical engineering from uh, University of Queensland. Uh, she's a senior process engineer with the Patterson and Cook currently, and she has a wide range of experience in different parts of the world. Uh, she has an introduction slide where she shows the maps of the, uh, where she has been to. Um, she has experience in uh, South Africa, Turkey, Brazil, Australia, and you can name it. And uh, it's not just stating she has experience with uh, feasibility studies, uh, circuit mass balance, simulation, and even combination circuits, and plant optimization and auditing, and things like that. A wide range of experience in mineral processing and metallurgy. And uh, today she's talking with us about tailings dewatering technology, which is pretty unique with the current given circumstances and what aspects and concepts we have and what they are using uh, currently in the field. Uh, I'm not the expert, so I'm going to leave it to Rachel to talk more about it. Thanks you, Rachel, I leave the floor to you. Okay, thank you, Muthu. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, thank you for inviting me to present at your um, mining seminar series. It's, it's very exciting. And um, I really wanted to share with the audience um, some background into tailings dewatering technology. I, I think it's a very hot topic at the moment. Um, and I think there's a lot of interest in our industry and in learning more about tailings and how we can improve um, our management of them. So I just wanted to start with a, a safety share. Um, this safety share is quite relevant because this was an incident that a colleague of mine had um, around a thickener. So he was conducting an audit of a thickener on site. And as you can see in the photograph, there's actually a bridge that runs across the thickener which is just a very large tank of, of water and solids. So as he was walking along this bridge, um, he actually fell into an inspection hole that had been left open um, by somebody who was working in the area at the time. When the person who um, had left it open, uh, left the location, but didn't place up any guards or signage or anything. Um, and there was an additional um, hindrance the froth sprays that are operating on the thickener were actually creating a mist-like um, situation. And so my colleague had low visibility as well as um, you know, no, no physical barriers stopping him from falling through that hole. Luckily, he didn't fall all the way through, <laughs> but he did fall all the way down to his hip and um, had a lot of bruising and swelling. So it's just a reminder about the importance of guarding open holes. Um, the, at a bare minimum, a, a, some signage, but really you should put up a physical barrier if you're gonna leave um, a hole um, uncovered. And from a personal point of view, when you're visiting a site, um, particularly if you're not familiar with the site, you should sort of raise your awareness of your surroundings and um, really pay attention, um, not just in front of you, but up and down as well. So, Mine tailings um, are a, a very large challenge in our industry. Uh, in a typical operation, the tailings that we produce is 95 plus percent of all the ore that you're treating or all the ore that you're mining. So it's, it's a very large volume of material that we need to handle and manage. Most of the tailings um, currently in the world are stored as wet tailings within a engineered impoundment. Um, tailings are usually thickened to some extent, um, mainly because we want to return that water back to the plant and reuse it. And these engineered impoundments, um, they can be built of any combination of waste rock, coarse tailings, or borrowed material. The, there um, are tailings facilities all over the world uh, managed at different uh, levels. So you can see on the right hand side here, this facility um, has a separate water pond. So they have very good water management here. They're taking water off the facility quickly and storing it in, in a separate pond that is designed for water storage. On the left-hand side, you can see here, um, this is a facility that is high up in the mountains. 
And you can see there's a lot of water sitting on top of that facility. So there's a lot of potential energy being stored in, in that water behind an engineered wall. So the question is, why do we dewater tailings? Um, we're adding cost by doing this and we're adding operational complexity. Tailings is not our value stream. So sometimes it can be difficult to, um, to convince management to spend money on, on your waste stream. Um, you know, one reason we dewater tailings is because we want to reuse that water back in the plant, uh, especially if we're in an area or region where the water cost is very high. But there is another um, very important reason, and I think that this is a, a, a reason that has been a big driver in a lot of changes that we have seen in our industry in the last year or so. So this is just a timeline starting from 2010. So in 2010, there was a dam failure in Hungary, um, which killed 10 people. So along with these fatalities, this caustic red mud um, caused a lot of environmental damage. The spill actually reached the Danube River, so it didn't just affect the local region, but it affected across borders. In 2014, there was another failure, this time at Mount Polly in British Columbia. Luckily, there were no fatalities at this operation, but again, these copper gold tailings that spilled into the environment caused a lot of damage, and it's taken a lot of time and money to clean those damage up. In 2015, so just a year later, we saw a devastating um, collapse at the Mariana or the Samaco, it's otherwise known as Samaco operation in Brazil. So this dam failure killed 19 people. You can see in the photograph, it's completely inundated um, this area where people were living. It's a residential area. And these are iron ore tailings. Um, and again, caused a lot of environmental damage. And then in 2019, the Brumadinho collapse in Brazil, which probably most of you are familiar with because it was you know, a very big global story. It was all over the news. This dam failure killed 270 people and there are still some people who are unaccounted for. Again, this is an iron ore tailings facility in Brazil. And in fact, um, one of the companies um, that is based in Brazil was involved with both this incident and the previous incident, um, the Mariana operation. So, the industry turned around and said, I think we've had enough of this. Um, we're starting to see a bit more devastation with every failure that we have. And so interestingly enough, the Church of England stepped in. And you might ask, you know, why, why the Church of England? This seems a little bit unusual. Um, but the Church of England actually runs a large pension fund. And so they're a, a large investor in the mineral resources industry. So as investors, um, they decided they wanted to pressure our industry to start improving our performance in this area. So the Church of England Pension Board, along with the Swedish Council of Ethics for the AP Funds, put together a letter, which is now known as the Church of England letter. And they sent this letter out to all the major mining companies, asking for public disclosure of all of the tailings facilities that they were responsible for. So there was a good response to this letter. Um, this is just an example from Rio Tinto's website. So you can see here that they have um, publicly disclosed the, a lot of information about every single facility that they are responsible for. And that includes for tailings facilities that are closed or inactive. It's not just the active facilities. But what you can see here in this table, and I'm not picking on Rio Tinto, every, every company has a very similar looking table. You can see that the hazard category based on consequence of failure for these tailings facilities ranges from low to very high. So there's a lot of facilities out there in the world that are sitting in what I would say is too high a category. Um, and subsequently, these companies are taking steps towards reducing those hazard categories um, through engineering. 
So in 2020, um, there, a group got together. Um, it was the International Council on Mining and Metals, um, the United Nations Environmental Program, and the Principles for Responsible Investment. And they came together and formed a global tailings review. And the outcome of this review was the publication of a standard. Um, so this is the global industry standard on tailings management. So this is a document um, that all ICMM members and anybody else who wants to um, are going to implement at their sites in order to reduce the risk and consequences associated with a tailings failure. So just a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a new development. Um, the, United Nations Environmental Program and the Principles for Responsible Investment have joined together um, to create an independent international institute to support the implementation of this standard. So you'll note here that the ICMM has not been included in this group. So essentially what they are trying to do is set up an external independent uh, watchdog. So someone outside of the mining industry to really um, make sure that there is some independent oversight on what we are doing. So it'll be very interesting to see how this evolves. This is quite a new announcement and we haven't seen what the actual outcome is yet, but it will be very interesting to follow in 2021. So the global tailing standard, it covers a lot of different topics, um, things like um, engagement with community, training, um, all sorts of things like that. But I'm going to focus in on um, the requirement 3.2 because this is um, the requirement that is directly affecting um, technologies, in particular dewatering technologies. So what the requirement says that for all new tailings facilities, the operator needs to consider all feasible sites, technologies and strategies for tailings management. So they need to look at a number of different options and justify um, why certain options are not feasible. They need to do this in order to assess, um, looking at, is there an alternative that minimizes, minimizes risk to people in the environment? And also, is there an alternative that minimizes the volume of tailings and water placed in an external facility? So I have bolded the minimizing volume of water because that's where dewatering tailings technologies come in. But there are also a lot of other developments and technologies um, being looked at right now that is going to be reducing the volume of tailings that need to be stored. And then you can also see that for existing facilities, so all brownfield operations, they are required to periodically review and refine their tailings management. So if you have a very old design or management system, you're required to have a look and see if there's any best practice that you should be implementing. This is a interesting study um, completed by David Lutner and his colleagues. And what they did was they went back and looked at some um, historic dam failures and it actually includes the Mount Polly um, and the Kolonta, one from Hungary on this graph. And so what they did was they looked at what was the ratio of the impoundment surface area that was occupied by a pool. So you can see here in the image at the top, um, this is the hung Hungary um, dam failure. On the left, you can see that there's a significant amount of that surface area being covered with a pool of water. And what they found, and it, it, it sort of makes sense um, intuitively, is that the, the higher the ratio of pool water to overall surface area, the higher the ratio of tailings released to the tailings that were stored in that facility. So this graph was published in 2015. And the authors have indicated that they are going to be updating this graph because it's not only the pooled water that needs to be included, but they also are going to include any liquefiable portion of the tailing. So if you have a liquefiable slurry, this is also to be included um, in this analysis. 
Uh, Brumadinho did not have a pool of water sitting on top of their facility, but what they did have was a volume of liquefiable tailings. And this is what um, caused such widespread damage is the, the sheer volume of tailings that left the facility. So if you have a poor tailings facility design and or poor operation of that facility, this increases the risk of failure. But it's that volume of liquefiable tailings in that facility that increases the consequences. So a filtered tailing stack, it's not 100% foolproof. It, it could have a failure, but it's expected that the consequences of such a failure will be significantly less than say for a, a wet facility in the, as in the photograph in the slide. So this is the tailings continuum. And so this is just a, a nice graphic to give you an idea of how our tailings properties change with the quantity of water that you remove from them. So as you go from left to right, this is increasing solids concentration. So you are removing more and more water. And on the very left-hand side, we have what we call conventional tailings. So this is usually the tailings as they are produced by the plant. And what we have here is a mixture of uh, liquids and particles, and these particles are usually um, freely settling within that liquid. And they have a shear stress, a fully sheared yield stress of about 5 to 20 pascals. Then we have thickened tailings. So thickened tailings um, have a lot less water than conventional tailings, but as you can see, it's still um, quite a turbulent liquid and you can still have freely settled particles. Now there's this sort of um, industry standard um, of what constitutes a paste. And so um, one of the standards is um, 100 pascals and above. And another standard is if you can see no bleed water. So a paste you can see in the photograph here, it's just like what you would imagine toothpaste to be. Um, if you, you can, it, it's, it can be transported, um, but once it's laid out, there's no bleed water coming out of that material. Then we have this blackout zone. And that, that blackout zone is between a paste and a cake. So a cake is a, a soil-like material. If you can imagine a, a wet sand that's got some air in it as well. And the reason why we have this blackout zone is that we have a material that is too thick to pump, but it's also too wet to convey or truck. So there's each material and, it's, it, and, and where this sits is material specific, has got this blackout zone um, where you can't pump it, but you also can't convey or truck it. So conventional tailings are not um, as common anymore. We usually have some, ex some degree of thickening um, at most operations. So this is a typical flow sheet for thickened tailings. Your tailings are fed to a high rate thickener and we usually, well, most of the time add a flocculant. So a flocculant is a polymer reagent and what it does is it binds particles together and it forms flocules. And so by binding particles together, you're creating a macrostructure that has a higher mass than the individual particles. And what this does is it allows that material to settle a lot faster than the settling rate of the individual particles. By increasing this rate, you can decrease the size of the thickener. And then the water that's recovered from a thickener um, is it's usually, it, sorry, it flows to the overflow um, and it's usually returned back to the plant as reclaimed water for processing. And then your thickened tailings is pumped to um, the tailings facility for deposition. The photograph shows um, multiple points of deposition. If you can see back into the, the background, there's, there's more than one point where this material is being spread out. A thickener is usually installed adjacent to the plant um, because this reduces the size of your piping and pumping system for the thickened tailings transport and also reduces the distance that your return water needs to be pumped. 
but you know you can have that thickener adjacent to a tailings facility and there are a number of applications that have this. So it really comes down to economics and real estate. So it's very site specific. So paste tailings or, or high density tailings, um, it's essentially a very similar flow sheet, but the thickener is a slightly different um, unit. So instead of a high rate thickener, we would move to a paste or a high density thickener. And again, this material, this paste or high density tailings is pumped to deposition. You can see in this photograph here, an example of central thickened discharge. So this is where you have a central point um, of discharge and it's, it flows out and forms a very, very um, gentle sort of slope. And in a typical facility, you'll have more than one point where you have this material being discharged. For paste and high density tailings, you might have to move away from a centrifugal pump and um, employ a PD pump um, because the material is quite thick. And again, that thickener can be either adjacent to the plant or it can be adjacent to the tailings facility. Paste thickening, there are some alternative um, flow sheets as well, which I haven't shown here, where you can use a combination of um, filtration and high rate thickening to mix together and produce a paste. So if you were to move to filtered um, tailings to produce a cake, you would typically still have a thickener step, um, but then you would take the thickener underflow and then send this to a filtration plant. So you can see here, I've selected um, just a pressure filter press and for this particular system, it requires compressed air. Um, if we were using a vacuum belt filter, we would um, have a vacuum pump as part of this flow sheet. And the filter cake um, is taken out of your filter plant and sent to the facility for stacking. And there's a number of ways this can be done. Either you can have a, a truck loadout bin um, and fill up trucks if you've got, um, if the economics make sense to take that out to the stack, or you can use um, a, a system of conveyors, um, mobile stacking equipment to take the filter cake out um, to produce the stack. You can see this photograph here. Um, this is the Carrara um, filtered tailings facility in Australia. This is currently the largest filtered tailings system in the world. Um, I believe they're, they're filtering 35,000 tons a day of tailings. So as I alluded to before, um, there are different types of thickener technology. So on the left hand side, we have uh, conventional tailings. And this is, this is what the original thickeners were um, back in the past. So these, these thickeners are very, very large, like huge diameters, and they have a very low sidewall height. Um, before the polymers, the flocculants were developed, um, the tailings would just be sent and allowed to settle naturally um, just under its own gravitational forces. But then when we developed the polymers that we use as flocculants, we were able to speed up that settling rate by producing those flocules. And so we were able to significantly reduce the diameter of these thickeners. So these thickeners um, were then called high rate thickeners. Um, this, they vary from vendor to vendor, but typically um, the sidewall heights are available in 2.4 to about 2.8 meters. And then we have a hybrid, um, which is called a high density or high compression thickener. And it sort of sits between a high rate thickener and a paste thickener. Um, it's, it, has a, it has a higher sidewall height, but not quite as deep as a paste thickener. And because you're now producing um, a, a higher solids underflow in the thickener, um, that's why they're called high density. We now introduce um, rakes to our, uh, um, sorry. Yes, we introduce rakes to our mechanism so that we can um, improve the dewatering performance and also get that material moving so that we don't have any um, hangups of material and you can pump the material out easily from the bottom. 
So a high density um, thickener is usually producing an underflow that's between 50 to 100 pascals. And then we have these um, paste thickeners, um, otherwise known as deep cone um, thickeners. And this is for that material that we looked at that looks like toothpaste. So it's a, a, above 100 pascals. And so these um, have very high sidewall heights. Um, and th what this does is it increases the residence time of your tailings within that settling tank. So because the material has a longer residence time, it has more time to settle and, um, and densify at the bottom of the thickener. And so um, you also can have a smaller footprint along with these. So these um, classifications uh, were developed by vendors. So again, it varies um, depending on who you're talking to. Um, and for example, a paste material, so a material that has a um, yield stress above 100 pascals, it can be made in a high rate thickener um, depending on the material. So it's very material specific. So filtration technology, we actually have a, a wide range of technologies available for our, for our use. Um, so on the left hand top corner, we have a horizontal vacuum belt filter. So this is a continuous um, filtration process and it's usually used for materials that are quite easy to filter um, and you can treat quite a high tonnage um, over this, this filter. And then on the second one is a vacuum disc filter. So this again is using a vacuum um, to create a pressure differential for filtration. But now, as you can see in the photograph, we have these discs that are sitting upright. And these are very useful um, if you want to reduce your footprint um, because, they, uh, because it's a vertical setup, you have um, a much smaller footprint, but um, one of the disadvantages of a disc filter compared to a vacuum belt filter is that now you've got gravity against your side. So you can't build as thick a cake on top of, on, on top of a, a disc filter as you could on a belt filter. Then we have a centrifuge and the centrifuge is basically um, like a tube that is spinning very quickly and using centrifugal forces to create that pressure differential for filtration. These um, are used quite a bit in the oil sands industry. Um, they haven't had a lot of application yet in, in, the, very, um, in, the, in the tailings um, for base metals because they are quite small. And so um, there's a bit of a scale up limitation and you actually require a lot of units um, for, the, for the larger sort of base metal operations. Then we have a horizontal plate filter press. So now we're using um, mechanical pressure and pumping pressure to create that um, pressure differential for filtration. Now the horizontal plate filter press, and you can see the photograph on the right, it, it has a limitation because you're stacking the plates one on top of another. So there's actually a mechanical loading um, constraint that, that has stopped these units from getting much larger. So by by turning it over and putting those plates vertical, such as in the vertical plate filter press, you can see now that you can build these um, very, very long. And so you can get a lot more filtration area um, per unit. But you've also got a larger footprint, as you can see here. So a general rule of thumb um, is that for materials that are relatively easy to filter, you can use the vacuum technology. So the horizontal vacuum belt filter and the vacuum disc filter. Um, for materials um, that are still fairly easy to filter, maybe a little bit more difficult, but still fairly easy, um, the centrifuge is, is quite a good application. And then if you have more difficult material to filter, it, you usually have to move to the filter presses. So this graph here just shows um, really quite nicely what the cost of water removal is um, as you move from technology to technology. So on the X axis, um, you can see that this is the moisture content within your tailings. So as you move from right to left, so as you go down in moisture content, you're removing more and more water. And then on the 
y-axis, we've got the relative cost of that dewatering. So that it's in US dollars per ton of tailing solids that you're treating. So as you can see, um, right down the bottom, this is where our sedimentation or our thickening um, dewatering technologies are sitting. And thickening is very cheap because you're basically using gravity and then you've also got some additional cost from a reagent to, to speed that process up. Um, thickening is usually in the cents per ton, um, whereas these other technologies start to move into the dollars per ton. So as you move into mechanical um, methods, so such as filtration, um, you're moving into sort of that dollars per ton um, up to, you know, $15 per ton. So you can imagine um, for a lot of operations, if you went to management and said, hey, $15 per ton to treat your tailings, you know, that's, that's a very large um, financial decision that would need to be made. Um, but there are a lot of operations that have decided, you know, that this is not really negotiable anymore um, for the reasons that we discussed earlier. So um, anything we can do to reduce that cost is going to be um, a plus for our industry. And then as we move into the thermal technologies, um, so, you know, those rotating drum dryers, um, now we're talking about, you know, $35 a ton. So as you move along these technologies, your costs increase exponentially. And then you can also see we have three curves here. Um, so what this is is showing um, how these costs change as your tailings become finer and finer in particle size distribution. So the finer your particle size distribution is, the more difficult it is to remove water. And so these costs go up. It's always a good idea to use sedimentation as far as you can. Um, so that's why we typically have a thickener ahead of filtration because it's a low cost, um, easy to operate technology and, and it gets rid of a lot of water before you even have to go to filtration. So there's a number of research opportunities that Patterson and Cook um, has identified and would love anybody in this audience to take up the challenge of. Um, there's different areas uh, for these research opportunities. So, um, you know, I talked about those polymers, those um, flocculants that we use to speed up the settling process. There are other advanced chemical treatments that could be looked at. Um, for example, um, hydrophobic coatings are being looked at. Is there a way that we can coat these particles with a hydrophobic um, layer? And, and, and increase the dewatering capacities of these um, units, of these technologies that we're using. Um, microwave drying is kind of a cutting edge technology. Um, however, it's extremely expensive. So, you know, is there a way we can come up with a more economic um, system for microwave drying tailings? One of the limitations with vacuum filtration is that we get poor performance at high elevation because we're relying on a vacuum pump to create that preferential differential, um, differential pre uh, pressure. So can we improve our vacuum-based filtration technology so that we can improve performance at high elevation? There are a lot of large operations in Peru and Chile and even here in Colorado where I'm based um, where, that are sitting at very high elevations and, you know, they have the same issues that we all do and they need to handle their tailings as well economically. Um, a lot of the equipment manufacturers are looking at creating larger pressure filters. Um, one of the limitations um, eventually is going to be mechanical loading limitations for these units. So um, is there some research that could be looked into um, better designs so that we can build larger and larger units. The pressure filtration, so those two filter presses that I showed um, at the bottom of the list, those are batch operations. Um, and so because they're batch operations, they have a lower availability than their vacuum filter counterparts. And so that's why the costs are often driven up by this. So if we could move um, pressure filtration from a batch to a continuous process, this could be a huge economic opportunity for this kind of technology. 
Um, supplementary dewatering, this, these are things like environmental drying. So could we um, filter our cake, but probably not go too dry so that we could save some money at the filter plant and then lay out that material um, in the sun or just any drying environment and, and get additional dewatering that way. Um, this would obviously be site specific because different regions will have different environmental conditions. But, you know, other than the material handling component, this is essentially a free source of drying energy. Um, there's also some work looking at electrokinetic technologies. Um, so looking at dewatering within the tailings facility itself. So that's, a, that's another um, opportunity that hasn't really got to commercial scale yet. And then um, not, nothing to do with dewatering tailings, but you know, reduction of tailings in the first place. This is extremely important because um, the less tailings that you need to manage, um, the better for everybody, the lower the costs, um, you know, the, le the lower the risk at your facility. So some technologies um, that could be looked at is ore sorting so that you um, disregard or discard, sorry, um, gang material before you even get to the plant. Selective mining, so being more efficient with our mining methods, um, you know, maybe even taking an economic hit in order to reduce your, your impact of tailings. Um, and also tailings as a product. So maybe we can start reusing some of our tailings um, and and sell them off as a product. Maybe you're not making a profit, but maybe you're just covering enough um, so that you're breaking even with your tailings management. And there's a number of initiatives at the moment that are looking at, you know, can we make products out of tailings? So um, thanks for your attention. I just have a quick photograph here because um, I find it very interesting. This is actually at Vale's Pico mine in Brazil, um, they have commissioned a pilot plant um, where they are actually going to make more than 60 different civil construction products from their tailings. So you can see here, um, they've started producing what look like to be pavers. And while this is gonna be a very, very long way from taking 100% of their tailings and repurposing them, um, I think that even if you can take a, a small percentage of your tailings and, and reuse them, I think that that's a step in the right direction. Um, so I've put a couple of resources at the bottom of the screen here. The first is the um, Global Tailings Review website. So you can actually go there and download a free copy of that standard that was published in August of last year. And then the second one, um, it's a really great tool. It's a, it's a Google Earth based um, application where you can actually um, look up different tailings facilities and it'll take you on a Google Earth map to look at the facility and then it provides a table of um, additional information. So I've found that to be quite useful. So are there any um, questions? Thanks a lot, Are you going to handle the questions, Muthu? Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, uh, is, I encourage participants, if you have a question, you can raise your hand in the, or uh, post it in the chat. You uh, Please, uh, there's one question which is already posted by Gawain, and it's not actually on this talk specifically. Yeah, maybe um, we can put that later. I think Michelle has a raised a raised her hand. I'm not sure if you can see that. Michelle, if you want to go ahead and okay, uh, unmute yourself and just ask the question. Um, yes, this is actually Jenny with Resource West. Um, Rachel, okay. can Sorry. you explain the That's okay. the goal um to making the tailings completely dry? Is that for a storage reason or an environmental reason or both? I mean, is that the ultimate goal to make them completely dry? So filtered, um, you know, there's actually a, a misnomer because uh, filtered stack tailings have been called dry stack tailings in the industry, but they're actually not dry. And it's a very good point that you're bringing up because, um, you know, we don't want to introduce a dusting issue, which is another health and environmental um, issue. 
So what filtered stacked tailings is, it's actually very similar to in civil engineering when, when you're creating um, like uh, earthworks for constructing of buildings, is that the material actually needs to be slightly damp um, in order to uh, reach its highest dent density when it's compacted. And so the idea of creating this, um, this moist filter cake is that um, you should be able to build a stack that is self-retaining, uh, so you don't need to have a big um, engineered embankment like we do with our wet facilities. It should be almost a freestanding um, structure, although I suspect that many designers are going to put some sort of um, retaining wall around it just be, you know, to increase that safety factor. But essentially building um, what's very similar to an earthworks um, project underneath, you know, say a large um, construction, if you're building a mall or something. Thank you. We have a question from Nickel. Um, so what tailings materials make good construction products so far in your experience? So um, I've noticed that um, in Brazil particularly, they're doing a lot of just construction material like bricks, um, that sort of thing. Um, I think that there are some applications um, for making fertilizers, depending on what you have in your tailings. Um, but to be honest, this is not an area I worked too strongly in. And um, um, I, I suspect that we're gonna see more and more uses as this becomes more of a, an issue in our industry. But yeah, essentially um, fertilizers and construction materials are the main things that I've seen in my research. Uh, Dr. Nelson, do you wanna go ahead I mean, yeah, I'm, I, most common phrase that we have in the world these days is you're muted, I think, so. I'm good. <laughs> I caught that before we got there. Um, Rachel, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And your expression of interest um, for pursuing some of these things is something that the new tailing center will certainly be interested in, having a conversation with you and Rob. Um, but I wanted to, to ask about two things. One is um, the character of the tailings themselves, in that um, in many cases we have not been making um, a, a good, gaining a good understanding of, of the tailings, their mineralogy, and how it changes um, temporally, which can change the spatial uh, distribution of the placements of what kind of materials going to form where. So I guess I'm thinking about um, industry interest in really tailings characterization on a more fundamental rather than an index property basis. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there's been a couple of discussions about um, where tailings have actually become brittle after placement. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, we want to know what went into the facility, but we also want to know, want to know what that looks like in five, 10, you know, a hundred years time. Right, so I'm glad you brought that up because uh, one of the issues with dry stacking is the potential for, there certainly is in an aerobic environment, so the potential for, for um, having some um, sulfide oxidation mm -hmm. um, can become important. So the design of those kinds of facilities are a little bit different from what we'd have in normal soil formation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd like to send you, really, I'm writing the last chapter of the tailings handbook for SME, and it's all about uh, potential uses for tailings. And I want to send it to you and, and ask you for comments, because uh, several of the things you mentioned, I, I did mention. Oh, yeah, fantastic. I would love to do that. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nelson. Um, we have a number of questions from Gaon. I'll go with the first one. Um, so how much of work has Patterson and Cook done in reprocessing of legacy tailings for enhanced mineral recovery? How much interest are you seeing in uh, remining of legacy tailings? 
So at this time, we haven't done a lot of work, um, but we have seen a lot of interest from our clients. Um, you know, I showed that graph from Rio Tinto's website um, where you've got these closed facilities or inactive facilities that still have a high risk profile. So if you're going to go back and, and do something with these, um, these legacy facilities, you may as well try to pay for it, um, pay for the whether it's relocation or dewatering, um, building a new facility, whatever it is you decide to do to reduce that risk profile. If you can generate some revenue to at least offset that cost, um, that's definitely a plus. So we have seen, we have a number of clients that are actively looking at this at the moment. Thank you. Uh, you have another question from Dr. Kobe Anderson. Uh, do you want to ask it yourself? Shall I go ahead? Oh, uh, I, I can ask it. Thanks, uh, thanks for the uh, talk, Rachel. I noticed that you mentioned um, disc filters, but uh, drum filters were, were left out. Was there a reason for that or? Um, no particular reason. We just don't see them as, as commonly used um, on, the, on the projects that we have worked on. But okay. I mean, certainly if, if it works, you can use it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Uh, we have a question from John, um, and this question is, do you see any opportunity for geotubes as a part of the process of dewatering, dewatering tailings? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, geotubes um, have really got an, a nice um, niche application. Um, you know, it's nice because you can kind of place them on top of one another. Um, by stacking them, you're actually increasing um, the dewatering rates of the ones that are below them. Um, but what, what we have found is that they are capacity limited. So they probably have a lot more application in your smaller um, operations, like gold, um, your smaller gold operations, but um, they're quite limited uh, when it comes to these large base metal operations, like the copper operations we've got in Chile. Um, because they they do it, it's a slow dewatering process. It's 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 nice because you can leave it and walk away, but it, it is still very slow. Awesome, uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Leslie Watson, and uh, the her question is: Are there techniques for dewatering existing tailing facilities in situ? Yes, there are, and so um, one of them was that electrokinetic technology um, that people are looking at. And then, um, oh, there is another one that I've kind of forgotten what it's called at the moment, I'm drawing a blank. Um, but yeah, there are a number of techniques um, out there. And if I can get the email address perhaps of the person who asked the question, I, I could send them more information because I'm drawing a blank right now. That's right. Uh, Leslie, can, can you please post your email uh, as a personal message in here, or you can send it to us in our LinkedIn page, how are you? Oh, yeah, uh, and I can send it to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so we have the next question is from, uh, is Garvin again, and uh, he's like, how is GeoTube cost effectiveness developing related to other technologies? I think you kind of covered that, or you haven't touched the cost on it, but his question is, uh, on GeoTube, how is GeoTube cost effectiveness developing related to other technologies? Again, they're very, they're, they are cost effective, but um, you know, then you need, you need a lot of them um, for large facilities and you need a lot of area to lay down those GeoTubes. So I think that they are a great option, but that they're gonna be at the, currently they're gonna be limited to smaller operations. Hmm. That's nice. Uh, thank you. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question, please? Sure. This is Tony from Batch. I have a question. Uh, what, is, what are the trends and the challenge for the improvement of thickness in terms of automation and continuous operation? Um, so thickeners are, are quite an established technology. And so um, they already run um, in a continuous fashion. And uh, really the main automation that we have seen um, is uh, controlling the flocculent dosage to your thickener. Um, so what you can do is you can measure your um, bed height within your thickener. 
And so if your bed height is starting to rise too quickly, um, that means you're not getting um, the consolidation um, that you're expecting. And so you can increase your flocculent dosage based on that. Um, and then um, also if you're adding too much flocculent, then your bed becomes too fluffy. And then this can also be measured um, by how high the bed is going. So mainly it's flocculent dosage that's being controlled by bed height measurements. Um, but other than that, um, thickeners are fairly, they're fairly straightforward to operate um, and, and they do run in a continuous fashion. Thank you. We have one last question. If you have some more, please keep uh, posting the chat box. Uh, our, um, Randall is asking, uh, what are your thoughts on using mechanical evaporators to reduce the volume of water in the tailing spots? Using mechanical operators um, such as a, a person in a, in a mobile equipment or? Um, Randall, do you want to clarify that? Evaporators, he's saying. Um, I mean, there are examples of, um, uh, they're, they're, they are looking at things like um, disking and, um, you know, if you can imagine farming equipment. So if you have farming equipment that's turning over soil, um, you can also do this in quite muddy environments. And so there are some operations looking at using mechanical mobile equipment um, to roll over tailings so that you can expose new surfaces for drying. Awesome. Um, let me let me just uh, this is Priscilla and just add one thing. They they have been doing some things that are relating to um, more soil techniques like um, wick drains, kinds of um, installation of drains to actually drive um, decrease the drainage path distance so the water doesn't take so long to get out. Have you seen many of those in use, Rachel? Um, I haven't personally seen them, but um, wick drains are common. And thank you, Priscilla, for saying it because that was the blank I was drawing before. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, wick drains. Um, yeah, so they, those are, are used um, at a, a number of operations, but I personally haven't seen one in action. Right, and they could even be combined with eductors in some cases so that you're actually taking stuff directly from geotechnical and applying it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Randall just wants to clarify his question. So I, before Ryan, I'll let him talk. You want to go ahead, Ryan? Uh, yes, thank you. So Rachel, the, the question I was asking is uh, mechanical evaporation equipment. So we, um, equipment that we can put out on the ponds to um, increase kind of the surface area by using water droplets, as long as those droplets are contained within the tailings facility. Have, have you heard much conversation about using um, those such mechanical evaporators? I haven't heard a lot about those, so I would, I would love to get more information from you, Randall, on that. Sure, I can email it to you. Thank you. Do you want to maybe spend uh, two minutes giving us a bit more background on that? Sure, so uh, we manufacture uh, mechanical evaporation equipment that can be used in many different um, facilities to help reduce the volumes of water. So for instance, we have floating units that will go out in the pond or we do have land-based units. But with our floating, we have a downdraft style evaporator that we push the water um, through it using, we can use pumps and nozzles or we have a unit that doesn't use any um, pumps or nozzles at all for, and has very little maintenance to it. So um, we use it to create water droplets on top of the pond um, which creates more surface area to be exposed to the um, air to where it evaporates at a much higher rate. Now, with the units we've um, designed here in the past couple of years, we control those water droplets to where they, we know where they're going. So we know we're not carrying them off site where you can have overspray issues or environmental concerns. So um, depending on, on the units, um, you know, there's different ways we can configure them to evaporate higher volumes of water per day while using very little energy to um, operate the equipment. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Randall. Uh, Maybe before, 
before we go for the next question, because we're kind of uh, coming close to the end of our time here, um, we are happy to take more questions uh, after if uh, Rachel has some more time to answer them. But um, let me just again thank you all for attending today with a record turnout with 115 people, I think, at a time. So thank you so much for calling in. I think that speaks to you, Rachel, and uh, the, the interest in the topic and uh, your talk. Um, so again, thank you, Rachel, for, for um, spending the time with us today. And uh, for everyone who's here in the, in the call at the moment, please uh, follow our form and um, uh, give us some feedback on how you like the seminar. If you uh, want to opt in for email notifications, you can do that. Um, I'm going to post that in the chat again. And uh, also, if you want to check out past recordings of the, our seminar from last year, um, you can do that over our YouTube channel. And we'll also upload um, this year's seminars on that channel. So um, with that, we're just going to continue taking questions. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending today. Um, thanks, Lucas. And thanks a lot, just for the talk. Um, I hope we could meet in person. And congrats. Thank you again. Um, <laughs> One day when this world is back to normal. <laughs> Um, I, I'll ask Ryan to go ahead now. He has been waiting for a while. Thanks, thanks for your patience, Ryan. Hey, no worries. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, Rachel, if you could um, talk about like some of the deciding factors that go into the degree of thickening that tailings undergo. I mean, obviously from a stability standpoint, the drier, the better. Um, and so I was just wondering, like you said, most facilities now are are thickening to some degree, but you know, I was just curious if there's one or more deciding factors um, uh, that go into that. Um, so, uh, if I understand your question correctly, um, you're you're sort of asking why one person would go with the thickened tailings, one would go with a paste and and the filter tailings. Um, so, as you remove water, the the costs increase. Um, but there's so many other factors that play into it. You know, we've got one uh, client who is moving to filter tailings because they don't have the real estate to put in um, a thickened um, engineered embankment tailings facility. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of changes in, in local regulations. Um, in, in Chile right now, um, you know, any operations that are in wetter regions, um, the local um, governments or, or governing agencies uh, are, are probably going to start mandating filtered tailings. So, you know, economics has always been the excuse of why not to go with filtered tailings. Um, but I think that there's going to be a, a lot of other drivers now where um, that's going to fall on the way by the wayside. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Rich, I just want to confirm with you if you're comfortable staying for a few more minutes to answer there are two or three more questions that's fine yeah, sure awesome thanks a lot um so next one is from ian um so he says he says you talked about uh brumadinho's failure uh being in large part due to liquefaction though disasters like uh marianas are making people question the long-term safety of upstream construction in general the long life time of these structures introduces oversight and detection risks. Uh, do you see improvements in tailings processing technologies as a way to significantly improve this construction method? So the ups, um, and again, I'm not a geotechnical engineer, so take my words with a, a grain of salt, but um, the upstream construction method, um, I believe is, is now not recommended. So it's not considered best practice anymore. So I think a lot of people are already moving to downstream construction and that central center line construction. Um, and I again, um, these long term projects, you know, um, you know, mining companies are obviously responsible for their facilities, um, you know, to, to the end of time. Um, some of our clients are actually looking at building um, like diversion walls. So um, if there's like a town nearby or, you know, um, the operation where everybody's working, um, they're actually considering putting up a large wall to divert the tailings um, to somewhere where it won't have impacts on, on people. So it's still on the environment, but not on the actual, um, you know, people that are working or living in the area. Um, so that, 
you know, designing for not if it fails, but when it fails. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Mohammed. Do you want to, uh, or Ashraf, sorry. Uh, do you want to go ahead, please? Oh, thanks for giving me the floor. So first, uh, this is not my field. So my curiosity might sound a little bit offhand. So I'm just curious to know if it's about de-weighting. Well, what is the prospect of that we can taking the advantage of electrostatics, like forcing the geotube surface act like an electrode surface so that they can repel the particles or droplets, whatever we are dealing with? Yes, definitely. Yeah, um, that, you know, that sounds like a combination of that electrokinetic technologies that they're looking at. Um, and, you know, also the, the hydrophobic um, coatings, which would repel the water as well. Yeah, that, you know, our, our industry is open to all new innovations in this area. Um, you know, we, we sort of, sometimes we can be fixed in our little, um, silos of, of, you know, mineral processing, but certainly we should be looking at, at other industries and other fields to find better solutions for dewatering. Okay, so so is there any specific R&D for uh, Patterson and Cook that they're currently focusing on that, or um, this is not in practice? So Patterson and Cook, um, we don't manufacture equipment. Um, so what, what we typically do is we look at um, the R&D that people are working on and then we assess them, um, assess whether we believe it, first of all, <laughs> um, right. assess um, how mature that technology is. And then um, if we think it's, you know, something that our clients will benefit from, then, you know, we'll take the next steps to, introduce these to our clients and, and get a team together to work and, and complete a proof of concept. Well, it makes sense. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more and I think that kind of close our great Q&A here. Um, Jeremy has a question. With the standard of dating management, do you see an uptrend in retrofitting current dating centers or making new ones? Um, I definitely see, um, I think we're going to see a trend of people going in and making changes to existing um, methods. Um, I, you know, a lot of the work that we do is, is coming onto brownfield sites that are running, you know, conventional um, tailings facilities and, and they want to make the move to, um, you know, either a thickened central discharge or they want to move to filter tailings. So, a lot of companies are, are evaluating filtered tailings. Um, it's, it's sort of seen as a, a gold standard. And so, you know, is there a way you can make it work economically for your facility? And sorry, what was the second part of that question? Okay. Um, is that, this is like asking whether you can retrofit current dating centers or make new ones. Is it going, you are going to see a trend in that, like uh, an uptrend in that? Um, I, I mean, you can't sort of, you can't convert a wet facility to a filter tailings facility, um, but we, there is actually an example um, in Chile where um, one of the operations um, decided that they didn't want their tailings facility um, to be at high elevation because like that photograph I showed before, you've got all that potential energy sitting at the top of a mountain. So they um, built a new tailings facility at a lower elevation, um, which was in a much better location and it wasn't going to um, have a huge impact of people downstream. And they are actually um, taking the tailings out of that old facility and sending it down to the new facility and, and, coming and mixing it with their new tailings that they're producing. Makes sense. Um, we have one last question from Gorman. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit technical one. So he says, given the susceptibility of tailings to liquefaction, has anyone tried intentionally liquefying tailings via vibration to cause the water to come to the surface or via dilatant flow and simultaneously densi densify the lower levels of tailings? That is a really great question. I'm glad somebody asked it. Um, so yes, people are looking at that. Um, 
they've looked at it. Um, the idea is to use explosives. <laughs> so, um, which, you know, if, if it's done correctly in a controlled manner, I mean, you know, it's going to give you the desired effect. But again, um, you know, there's also risks associated with that. But that, that is something that's actively being looked at um, using explosives at the moment. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this has been a question from Gawain initially, but not relevant to the talk. And um, his question is more about the position that's coming from Patterson Cook, if you're okay with answering that. Uh, and he's asking if Patterson Cook uh, would sponsor engineers if their positions are outside US. Um, sponsor what, sorry? Uh, positions that? like uh, new hiring positions in your company. Oh, new hires in our company? Oh, yeah. yeah. So we actually have offices um, in different areas in the world. So we've got um, an office in Perth um, in Australia. We have um, three offices in Canada. We have an office in Santiago. Um, and we have offices in South Africa and the UK. So um, yeah, there's, we've got quite a wide range of places that you could apply for <laughs> positions, definitely. Um, uh, his question is more specific, like, is, uh, do you usually hire locally in those countries or is it like you'd hire from here and not, and you fund, sponsor them to move over there? Well, as long as there's no US immigration people on the call, just kidding. <laughs> um, so we, 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 you know, we, we try to hire the best people. And so that's always been our motto is that our company is, is its strength is its people. You know, we don't manufacture equipment. Um, our assets are our engineers. So, you know, we strive to find the very best people for the job. That's a nice way to put <laughs> uh, Thank you. I uh, guess that concludes the Q&A section. Thanks a lot, Rachel, for staying back and answering them. And thanks a lot to our participants for joining us today. Really appreciate uh, such a large turnout. Um, and I hope we can meet sometime in person and we are welcome to visit us at Mind's Rachel anytime. Um, thanks a lot for your talk uh, and have a nice day. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much.